Hi. <laughs> it's nice to see you. How are you all? Let's do, let's do an exercise. I'll say, how are you doing? And then you'll put your hands up like this, and you'll say, I'm doing the best that I can. Ready? How are you doing? I'm doing the best that I can. <laughs> That's how I start every one of my classes at UC Santa Cruz. <laughs> Um, so I'm here today to talk to you about the future, um, but I also want to talk a little bit about where I came from. Uh, this is kind of the modern version of me. Um, I was recently on Project Runway. That's what most people remember about me now. The most, most amazing thing I've done is judge other people's outfits. But um, I've also, I've had a pretty broad career that's led to a pretty public profile in gaming, and specifically as a woman in gaming. Um, but when I was younger, <laughs> uh, I started off as a grad student, and this is the very first GDC that I went to. So this is what games looked like in 2000. This was down in San Jose. Um, it was about uh, you know 12 years into the games uh, GDC uh, sort of conference being held. The first time that GDC was held. Uh, in 1988 in Chris Crawford's living room. There were 27 attendees. Uh, and in 2018, when I hosted the award show, there were 28,000. This year, there were over 30. Um, so it's been a big deal. Games have become a really big deal. And um, when I started going to conferences, this is what I look like. I was a graduate student in computer science and robotics at the University of Chicago um, and then Northwestern University. Um, I really had no idea that I was going to end up on stage giving away the Game of the Year award uh, 20 years later. So, you know, it's interesting to think about how that happened. Um, I began studying computers, games, and play from the perspective of robotics. And I was, basically, I graduated in three years and I had no idea what I wanted to do. So I thought, well, I'll just hang out in the lab. And then someone said, why don't you program some robots, I ended up working with a Sony Ibo, which I thought was fucking amazing. Like I was really excited to be able to work with these things. It turned out they didn't work so great. So um, you had to attach them to a Magellan base, which had a big battery, and there was a lot of tuning and physical issues with running the robots. And I started getting kind of frustrated with working with physical robots. It's not nearly as fun as it is today. And I ended up thinking more and more about the simulation component of what I was doing and the design component of what I was doing and getting fascinated by games. And so I wrote a paper with some friends of mine from school and a friend of mine from MIT about how to design games from a feeling perspective as opposed to from a mechanics perspective um, and started thinking a lot about what that meant for games and game design as a medium. Um, I have always been a person who's between things. I kind of think of myself as right in the middle between being a scientist and an artist, a woman and a man, a fighter and a lover. <laughs> like, I'm really in the middle. And when I was in school, people wanted me to choose. I was always being told to pick a side, and I didn't like it. And so I started thinking about games, and in particular, games education, because there was no games education when I was trying to do this stuff. And like, what would an ideal program be like? And I started working with the IGDA on a games curriculum and founded a summit at GDC where I got a bunch of my friends, uh, including Tracy Fullerton and some folks from CMU, some folks from MIT, together to talk about education in gaming and potentially get game designers and educators to collaborate on building systems that could teach game design in university settings. And that conference is still running. Um, it was funded by, uh, by Epic in 2018, 2019, I spoke at it. Um, so just even in the 20 years that I went from being a student to a practitioner in games and then back to being a professor, the, the capacity for us to think about games from an educational perspective in terms of teaching people how to design games and think about games from the focus of innovation has also really radically exploded, which is amazing. Um, you can kind of think of me as a prototypical uh, example of someone who went from being a grad student to an artist and then to an indie games creator. The, the word indie games didn't even exist when this stuff was happening. Um, the way that that happened for me was that I got together with a bunch of my friends from the industry and we got together for a weekend and we decided to make games in this room in Oakland uh, on an engine that was written by Otman Binstock. He's in the top 
back corner there. He's now the chief research scientist at uh, Google or Facebook Oculus. Um, Brian Sharp, who made Medium, is in this room. Austin Grossman, who is at Magic Leap, is in this room. Um, Heim Gingold, who wrote The Creature Creator for Spore, is in this room. A lot of people that were, at the time, kind of ne'er-do-well, loser games people that hadn't shipped anything, very young, um, and kind of wondering, like, well, how are we ever going to make a game that's going to be commercial? Well, what if we don't? We'll just, uh, we'll do this thing, and we'll call it a game jam, and then we'll put the games up on the internet for free. And we did it with the support of Intel. I was actually the sysadmin. It's me working with Sean Barrett. Um, I set up the physics uh, application, this physics game engine that Ottman wrote on all these computers. And then I worked on little games for myself on the side. And I, I helped people with the engine. And then we published those games online. And it was called the Indie Game Jam. Uh, and that led to a couple people in Austin doing a game jam. And then a couple people in New York did a game jam. And the next thing you knew, uh, game jams had become a thing. And as a result of that, we started having so many games to show and so much experimentation happening in the industry that I was able to start hosting and uh, curating for the Experimental Gameplay Workshop, which happens once a year uh, at GDC. Uh, it's about uh, 20 slots over a two and a half to three hour period. We get over 300 submissions a year now. It's the most exclusive indie game showcase of all time. Uh, and we've demoed games like Katamari Damacy and Guitar Hero, Rock Band, Portal, games that were at the time considered revolutionarily indie, uh, which now when you think of indie games, it's like kind of a laugh that like something like Portal would be considered an indie game. But um, we got into the habit of thinking about games as more than just what you could buy in a store on a disc. And that was pretty amazing. So just the diversity of content that has happened in just even the indie game showcase over the last 20 years has also exploded. Um, but what I started noticing as I got older in my career was that the diversity wasn't changing on another front. And so around five years ago, um, there were some angry people on the internet that were making everyone unhappy, and I got upset with them and thought, what could I do to concretely make a measurable difference in the number of people that are uh, female, of color, queer, differently abled, uh, from different cultures that don't typically get associated with game design, i.e. not Japanese, not from Western uh, United, not from the United States or, or South America or, or Europe. Um, how can I get those people up in front of everybody? And so I helped design this showcase called Amplifying New Voices, which happens every year. At the beginning of GDC, we fly 36 people out. We give them a free ticket to the show. We give them airfare, hotel, and we give them a day of media training where we film them talking and then show them what they look like on stage, give them the confidence to be able to represent their community with confidence in public on stage at a conference like GDC to encourage them to explore the idea of becoming an ambassador for their vision. And at the same time, watched the curriculum framework that I had made with Eric Zimmerman and Doug Church and Warren Spector and Jason De La Roca become the framework for many educational programs, and the Game Jam concept turned into stuff like the Global Game Jam, which served on the theme committee for that for about 10 years. So when you think about it, it's a better time to be making games now than ever before. And you can be making games as a woman living on the other side of the planet with a lot of other women, people that, people that know your culture, that know your perspective, that understand your in-jokes, and then you can put those games on the internet and they can be celebrated all over the world. It's, it's really fantastic. Um, and I think that that's, it's a story that I've told before, but like it's very important right now to reflect on what that means for the future. I moved back to San Francisco after finishing Journey and founded a games program at the University of California, Santa Cruz, which is now the fastest growing undergraduate major on campus. It just graduated 70 students out of a cohort of 180, yes. <laughs> a shared cohort across computer science and art. Everyone in the arts program has to learn to program. Everyone in the programming program has to learn how to draw and communicate and design and produce. And so the idea is to create a shared cohort that has a shared language for making games because I never wanted to choose. And I don't ever want my students to have to choose. Sure, they have to get a degree in design, production, art, or programming currently, but there's no reason they can't do both. And pretty soon, if we can get the university to allow us to offer both degrees together as a shared major, then they can graduate with both degrees. And wouldn't that be fantastic to be in the middle and not have to 
sell yourself as one thing or another. When I started making video games, you had to know a guy who knew a guy who knew a guy who worked at a publisher who knew a guy to get a game into a GameStop. And it was extremely narrow needle that you could have to get through to get content out. And as you were kind of hearing on the panel before, that conservatism influenced the kind of games that you could make. I still have never made a game with a gun in it, and I still only made innovative games. You know, My Sims was a, a game based on the Sims franchise where instead of hoarding stuff, you give it away. Like, someone let me do that on the Nintendo Wii, which is, you know, crazy. Um, Boomblox won a BAFTA, you know? I mean, that's like, it was, a, it was innovative enough at the time. It's a game where you throw stuff at stuff and it blows up. <laughs> so it's not, a, it's not a gun, but it's as close to a gun as it could be. And, uh, and it still was considered innovative at the time. That's how conservative the community of games production was. Games like Mr. Mosquito, or Dog's Life, or, um, you know, any number of bizarre Japanese titles that came over and immediately went to the cut bin, this was, that was kind of the height of innovation. Like, oh, it's a game where you go to the top of a mountain in Tibet and it's spooky, like, I would buy it, right? Me and like 10 other people in the United States. Um, but when you look at what happened in my career when I left EA and went to that game company, took over this five-person team, became the executive producer, and started running, running that team and building it and building Journey, like, Journey took three years to make, and when it shipped, it shipped as a digital title for $14.99 in a store, team of 12 to 15 people, about 15 at tops, making it. Um, it was like a three and a half million dollar budget, and it's sold millions of units, and it just went out on the Epic Store, so if you haven't bought it because it's on the PlayStation, now you have no excuse, you can buy it on the PC. Um, this game is the direct result of all of my efforts to innovate in how games are taught, because all the people that worked at TGC when I arrived had all come from a program at USC, started by Tracy Fullerton, who was at that education summit. It was a digital distribution method that was pioneered by things like the Indie Game Jam and Intel releasing games for free on the internet and showing that people had interest in independent titles. And that a weird physics game could do really well. And it was the result of those systems combining to reduce the conservatism and the tendency to focus on commercialization only in the space of commercial video games so that we don't necessarily have to feel the downwards pressure that would oppress away non-conformist voices about what experiences and games could be. Journey is a game where you walk to a mountain and maybe you meet someone along the way. And I can tell you when we pitched it, that was not something that people thought would sell. So no matter how you look at it, I would say that all of this is the direct result of efforts that myself, people like Ottman, Brian, Doug Church, Chris Hecker, John Blow, there's a lot of us in the community that were like kind of at the edges and the fringes of the community really wanting to see the games industry change. We pushed those changes forward and in many ways made those successful access careers and on-ramps to building the companies and the games that we wanted to make, right? Um, and that is a movement which has and continues to enable independent creators and supports creative expression in the face of more controlled systems of production and distribution. So after shipping Journey, I thought, well, what am I gonna do next? Because I've already done the thing where I made the game that I really wanted to make. I was like, well, what if I made a company where I could hire another woman? I was the last woman hired at TGC. Uh, and I was number six, so I could never really seem to get women into the boat, and I was getting really frustrated with that, so I was like, well, I'll just build my own boat, and then we'll see. The phenomenon is uh, 30 people right now are about 60% non-cis white male, it's located in downtown San Francisco. It's incredibly expensive. If you want to cut me a check, come see me after the talk. Um, we started making games that were known for being either extremely quirky and socially focused on ideas of connection, friendship, collaboration, and creativity, as well as sculptural experiences with music and sound that explore new mediums of expression like virtual reality and augmented reality. Luna, which has won numerous awards, is actually an old slide, um, will ship on the PlayStation and PS4 tomorrow. Oh, <laughs> 
so building content like this became the platform by which Phenomena was able to express unique opinions about what it means to be creative and play together in new ways on platforms that had yet been colonized by the colonizer's perspective on what play and games and winning really mean. So that really sounds sexy, like working on emerging platforms, it sounds sexy, but like what does that really mean? And so what this talk is about is that. Um, I think it's actually a much bigger deal than people realize. Um, when you look at what VR, AR, mixed reality, whatever you want to call it, um, is about, it's about altering the way we perceive right now. Um, and the example that I'd give you uh, to sort of get your mind thinking about this is, um, is coloring with crayons. Uh, how many of you had the experience of getting a coloring book and crayons when you were a child and being told to try to color inside the lines with the crayons? Show of hands. Okay, great. Um, how many of you have children right now that are in that age range? Show of hands. How many of them have learned to color on an iPad? Right. So on the iPad, you put your finger on the color, and then you put your finger in the circle, and then it colors, usually. Um, and if you have a fat little finger, you can kind of put it in the color place, and it doesn't really work, because it doesn't really register. So you're learning about color by selecting and placing, and sometimes you're learning to select multiple times because you think you didn't get it, and putting it in. And what you're learning when you're learning that application is you're learning someone's perspective on that application. When you pick up a crayon made of physical wax filled with pigment and you rub it on a piece of paper and then you drop the crayon and it falls in the ground, you are learning physics. You are learning the interaction between physical behaviors that you do and gravity, the way that heat and friction cause pigment to expand from the wax onto the paper and you can even blend the colors if you get really crafty. You're also learning fine motor control. All of those things are contained in a system that never changes. The physical way that you color in a coloring book does not change because we are in a reality that for some reason the game designer has decided to leave this way forever. But that's not the case with the iPad and it's certainly not the case when you have a headset on that lets you play with a Pokemon in your backyard. That Pokemon can do a lot of stuff that you physically can't do and what we're going to be teaching people and what they're going to be learning are gonna be massively influenced by the fact that the rules can change at any moment and not only can the rules change but somebody can go your mom didn't pay the bill. Would you like to watch an ad to keep playing with Pokemon? Uh, you need a Heineken. <laughs> so when you read games industry coverage about XR, it's really whiny. Like there was just an article in Forbes about the quest. I'm already regretting buying a quest. There's not enough content. It doesn't look like regular games look. And that's fine. Um, I don't think that games people have really been able to embrace the, the massive change that's gonna come with augmented reality devices because they're still trapped in the market speak of their funders, right? So let's let the game designers and the game companies off the hook. Let's even let the hardware manufacturers off the hook. Even if their product budgets aren't big enough, they're trying. It's really about the analysts and their idea that they understand what the future is and that they're only focused on the market dynamics of this thing. It's not about market dynamics. There are many other things that will influence why we adopt XR. It's not about games. Um, so let's not talk about the market size. Let's not talk about the headsets. Let's not talk about the form factor. Let's not talk about how expensive it is to make art on this platform because all that shit will change. Like, if you care about it, you know that already. It's, there's literally no point in complaining. You just gotta suck it up and work with what you got. And why? Because we have to assume adoption. We have to assume that this technology is going to become essential to our survival on the planet for a variety of reasons, and when it does, we wanna have the environments that we spend time in virtually, because getting on a plane and flying to Paris to see someone is either incredibly expensive, dangerous, or both. We want to assume that that travel that you suddenly can't do is replaced by something really lovely. Let's not build virtual realities that feel like Twitter or Asana. I mean, God forbid Excel, you know? So for the rest of the talk, I want you to assume adoption. 
Imagine a world 10 years, 20 years, 1,000 years from now, if we're alive then, where everything can be seen through a modified lens, where your eyes can be influenced by digital technology, and therefore your perception, potentially even your whole body, if you really want to go all the way to a nanomatter suit. In such a reality, the concept of a natural environment no longer makes sense. This idea of projecting the screen up here using these electrically powered projectors just goes away. You just see it wherever you want to look. I can put it right here. I can walk around it. You can zoom in on me and see me at any scale you want to. That stuff all happens. The natural environment isn't really a thing anymore. You can get on your bike, put on your glasses, ride on a virtualized route. You can see the Pokemon at the breakfast table. It's just happening. And the built environment is going to be designed so that a lot of this surface area is projectable by your eyes, and there are going to be more kinds of spaces, a lot more platforms in your life, a lot more things that allow space for digital objects as well as physical. Design of physical homes is going to become different. All kinds of workplace designs will change. The actual ability to use designed objects, like an alarm clock. Right now, your alarm clock is your phone, probably. Um, because we no longer really use alarm clocks, because you can pick up your phone and immediately experience FOMO by checking Instagram, and everyone knows that's the best way to start your day. So we all do that now. I'm guilty of it. That's why I bring it up. Um, so your phone rings, boop, 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 or it says da 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 da, or fuck you, get up, and you like pick up the phone, and then you experience your FOMO, and then you're like, uh, it's raining, uh, I gotta, uh, and then. Oh no, I'm more FOMO. I'm just like, I got it. I didn't really want to turn in that dissertation draft today. I guess I'll just, oh my God. What's going on in the world? Someone's blowing up someone else, and uh, right? Um, what if your alarm clock was a physical speaker next to your bed that woke you up slowly, and then you picked up your glasses, and you put them on, and you just looked at the ceiling, and it was like, oh, FOMO, shit, no. <laughs> Maybe we, don't know, maybe we don't do that. Maybe we put in an inspiring quote from the Dalai Lama. Maybe we show you what it looks like at your train station right now. How crowded is it? Are people carrying umbrellas? Is it pouring rain? Like, the weather, when you look at it on the iPhone, you're just like, well, is it really rain? I mean, how raining is it? Is it like, I can't wear open-toed shoes raining? Is it like, everyone is sad and doesn't want to get out of the house raining? Is it like, time for that fabulous raincoat because it might sprinkle? Like, that's something that you can communicate with an image that you cannot communicate with a cloud raining on a you know, screen with a temperature, right? So like, this kind of stuff we could design, and you could put your glasses on, and then you could literally get up and go and sit down in your living room and do a meditation session or some exercise, and then after all sweaty, take them off and go and take a shower and get ready for work. It could even tell you how to make breakfast. You could look up from your stove at the wall. This morning I'm doing Julia Child's white egg omelet. Holy shit, I'm amazing. Mmm, sounds good, right? So the design of all these flows is currently based on physical hardware and physical experiences and craning your neck over this device like this. Um, it doesn't have to be that way anymore. Sentient beings no longer have to be the focus of what you're interacting with, especially for that child I was talking about earlier. Once you've been interacting with a little small-scale Pokemon character and grown up with virtual friends that are not really that invisible anymore, um, the idea of going online and hanging out with three or four people where two of them are characters from your favorite film, not a problem. And so then the question becomes, well, what is the design of those characters? Like, is it literally Cortana? Like a femme bot sexy girl and like a skin tight piece of clothing that kind of looks like a battle ready G string with a sexy voice who's like telling you that she's really excited about you have three meetings today. <laughs> I'm so excited to help you get to Franklin, New Jersey. <laughs> We're almost there. You're the love of my life. I mean, kind of, right? Unless, unless something happens, unless we decide to do something differently. The idea of physical distance becomes not a real problem anymore because you can res up your friend and have a conversation with them because it's, it's possible. It's just limited by bandwidth and, you know, we've solved these problems before. I mean, you know, I had a Newton, so I remember what the iPhone used to look like and what it was capable of. And now it's better than a tricorder. So, like, you know, we're really, we're getting there. It can't zap people yet. Maybe that's a good thing. Um, the idea of being able to spend time with other people, like I read recently about someone who had recorded their grandmother who has now passed away, and then they 
they rezzed her up and had a picnic with her. It's not such a bad idea. Which is crossing the barrier of time. What if I am a mom, I'm not, but what if I was, and I wanted my kids to remember to put uh, their lunches and their book bags before they get to school, but I just did a run and I gotta take a shower. Well, I might rez up the version of me that stands by the front door and says, did you wash your hands after you went to the bathroom? Did you brush your teeth? Did you put your lunch in your backpack? And they gotta see me before they get out the door. Suddenly I'm able to leave messages, like virtual messages for people that are a little bit more caring and a little bit more real. I'd love to read you this bedtime story. I'm not even gonna be able to make it through the virtualized app that we have currently. I'm just gonna record myself saying goodnight to you here. There are so many possibilities of what can be created once you assume adoption and you stop being so swayed by naysaying market analysts or journalists who think they know what the future of humanity is, who haven't even looked up from their desks long enough to real, realize that climate change, economic change, and the results of those two things together are radically going to transform the way society works. So why don't we think about that instead? Well, it's hard to think about all those possibilities. It's so much easier to think about making another Pokemon. What's the newest, hottest AR app? It's like Pokemon, only you use Minecraft guys. Like, that's easy. It's product design, it's not designing reality. And you can't get away with that after a couple of generations of this stuff. Nobody wants it. It's like the equivalent of mindless. So what I wanna focus on in the talk, and what this talk is a talk that I've been giving for about a year now, is having a post-fidelity mindset and actually doing the work of thinking about what it means to design reality. Like, it is really clear, this is Horizon Zero Dawn, my friend Angie's game, huge success on the PlayStation, just gorgeous. Runtime graphics, off the charts, fogs, shiny robots, yeah, she looks amazing, she's got great hair, you know, surface scattering on the skin, it's like, oh, you know, like, looks great, like, we can do it, it's done. When I was in grad school, people dreamed of this. Oh, now we have it. But what does that mean? There's fidelity, but really what is it? My definition of fidelity is that it is realism, so to speak, and that we've designed spaces that feel natural with a pleasing amount of density. They're not real. Like if you really walk around and look, that plant is a little bit too present in this area. It's enough that it doesn't feel like there's a gap. It's like stage design, right? You just want enough of the scrim moving so that you get the impression of the ocean. It's not really waves. Um, but it's enough that we feel okay about being there. And then there are these appropriate responses from the dinosaurs or the robots or the dinosaur robots or the people. And what you end up with is that it is a believable enough environment. That's what fidelity-based game design and experience design and interactivity is about. We simulate that reality with physics and animation. So we've designed a bunch of really complicated tools to allow physics and simulation to, 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 to happen in real time so that we feel like the world is the same as drawing with crayons or as close to it as possible. And then we script the story and the emotional beats of that experience so that it feels like we're doing the right thing when we do it. But what we do when we do that is we often script actual choice. So we get designs like this, where you go from one place to another place and then you get a decision and then you go from this place to this place and you get another decision. In the end, you always end up at six. Everybody ends up at six. And at six, there's a terrible boss fight battle and like you have to fight the guy and like, or there's a proposal and there's never a proposal at six. That's just not the games that we make right now, but maybe someday. Um, but this is what usually happens in development is that we get so caught up building the ending in the beginning that we end up running out of time in the middle and eh, it's not that choicy. It's like cool, it feels cool and I'm the hero. Or we do this. A lot of different areas, this hot side stays hot and the cool side stays cool. Like you can move around, you can decide what you're doing. But you are the reason that the game moves along its emotional curves. So there isn't really any sense of drama. 
You know, it's like you have to give away that sense of authorial control and the curves and let people kind of manage their own level of activity. A game like The Sims would be a perfect example of this, except that it isn't, because The Sims is actually a dynamic game. And it's a game that focuses on building systems that act dynamically, and that was where I started in game design and where I think we've lost a lot of opportunities, especially in this community. What is dynamism? Well, we have these living spaces that are changing. They have a satisficing density. It's not real. Like the original Sims, they walked around like this, you know, and like their get in for a chair was, you know, not very realistic, not very high fidelity, but it was enough because there was so much other stuff going on and they were doing interesting things with each other that you wanted to explore the space. So think about that. It's the opposite of the fidelity mindset. Instead of having a space that you don't really want to explore because it's just a bunch of the same tree, you just want to get to the dinosaur robot thing and kill it and then get the cutscene. You have, what are they doing? Why is it taking its clothes off and having a sponge bath in the kitchen? I'm totally confused. <laughs> Tell me more. So this is a way of designing that simplifies the spaces and it simplifies the physics, but it simulates with animation, actions, and emotional responses in an interesting way that actually expands choice. And, you know, it doesn't look real, but it feels cool. Instead of this, you get this or this. One choice leads to several choices, which leads to several things, and then you get down here and you're like, oh man, I probably should have chose something else. Back out, start over, make a new family, sorry dad, you know, do it over. Or this, which is every time you make a choice, you're changing the weights on the graph, so, you know, if you choose this a couple times, suddenly that, that branch is no longer gonna be available anymore. That character, doesn't like you anymore. My favorite example from The Sims when I was working on The Sims was my first job out of grad school. I dropped out of my PhD at 32 to go work on The Sims. My parents were like, what? Um, my favorite example was I had a testing character named Tony Testervojevich who was like really, really, really intense. And uh, he ended up getting into a fight with an intense person and they ended up falling in love because they hated each other so much. I had no idea that The Sims had this setting. So when you think about this stuff, when you think about the kinds of games that we're creating, when you think about the ways in which games work for something like this, the question that I want to leave you with is effectively this. Do you want to create this space? Do you want to build games that lead to this. There are so many amazing things that you can do on the headset. You can design systems and spaces and responses to those systems that cause people to look up and to interact with each other about a third thing. You can create systems that change over time that cause people to be curious and discuss what's happening or you can build systems that cause people to have FOMO and consume. And I really think that the way you get past this is by moving away from fidelity-based thinking towards dynamism and thinking about the systems that are embedded in this world. What's a system that these things impact every day in New York City all the time? Wayfinding, right? You're walking around, you're constantly bumping into people that are using their phone and you're using your phone, right? It's not a positive thing. Like, this experience is causing the world to become a channeled, tracked place, and if we keep designing this kind of stuff, it won't matter, we won't even, we won't even notice the people anymore. We'll eliminate the bumping, and then there'll just be nothing. You'll just be on the track. Your job as a designer is to think about difficult problems in the space of design from the perspective of dynamism and real life, real systems, to think about how you get the crayons to matter, not to replace the crayons with something like this. The more you focus on a beautiful piece of coloring and the less you focus on the skill and the experience and the people and the feedback, the more you're building people into a bubble. 
Like, I teach at a university, and this is what I see. The students that I teach are supposed to be meeting each other and falling in love and getting drunk and making mistakes. But they're still hanging out with their friends on Snapchat from high school. It's very, very easy to get stuck in a commoditized, marketed, feed-based thinking system or an experiential tube experience game design system and not think about building systems that encourage us to collaborate and talk and share with one another. It's so important that you don't fall into this trap. Thank you. <laughs>